Tommy Robinson was the founder and leader of the English Defence League, always in the forefront of their controversial street protests. I don't care whether you sound racist. I don't care what you say to me. I don't care if you want to kill me. But then, three weeks ago, he suddenly announced he was leaving. I'm asking all my supporters who have followed me to put faith in the decision we're making and follow. He jumped ship to Quilliam, a counter-extremism think tank led by former Islamic extremist Majid Nawaz. It's a very wonderfully courageous and brave thing to do. But what made Tommy go from saying this... Islam is not a religion of peace. Islam is fascist and it's violent, but this is the end. ...to saying this. I don't believe street protest is the way forward. To solve the problem, we need the support and we need to work with Muslims in this country. Tonight, we tell the full story behind Tommy Robinson's resignation, how his journey with Mo Ansa, the man who tried to get the EDL banned, led to him quitting the organisation he'd founded. We need to change somehow. We do need to change. And brought him together with Majid Nawaz. You need to win the hearts and minds of the people. Is this the end of the EDL? And is it the beginning of a new Tommy Robinson? Or just a change of tactics? In April 2012, Tommy Robinson and Mo Ansa took part in the BBC programme The Big Questions to debate far-right extremism. Can't call everyone who opposes anything to do with Islam far-right. It's not right. You are bedfellows with people who are saying that we want to outlaw the Quran, we want to outlaw the hijab, we want to, no. we want to deport Muslims from Europe. You are trying to become now a soft face which is appeasing hatred against Muslims and Islamophobia. Islam is failing to integrate. Islam needs to evolve, it needs to modernise. Then Mo Ansa, the man who had tried to get the EDL banned, issued a surprising invitation. Tommy, if you and your family ever want to come to meet my family for dinner, you are more than welcome. This simple gesture of friendship led to Tommy and Mo agreeing to go on a journey together around British Islam. I had in my mind before we started the programme that if the opportunity came up, that I'd want to try and reach out to him somehow. I wanted to try and connect with him, just try and educate him. I called him no answer rather than no answer. Because <laughs> he doesn't seem to have an answer to a lot of the issues. But at the same time, I could I've warm, I warm to him when I meet him. It's a journey where Mo took a huge risk attending an EDL rally. I'm incredibly nervous being here. Tommy paid his first visit to a mosque this is Mohammed Ansar, everybody. Say hello. Mo became the first Muslim ever to address the EDL. I.e. slaves. And Tommy was confronted by his critics. Where does it say sexual slaves? Where does it say sexual slaves? I discovered an unlikely ally of a young girl's covering up their hair. I, as a Muslim woman, feel uncomfortable when I see young girls, you know, as, even if, they, if they're seven, six, because I do think it's about being grown up. Tommy's personal story began in Luton, his hometown, and one of the few places in Britain where Christians are in a minority. Living here shaped his view of Islam. Back in 2009, a group of Islamic extremists staged a protest in Luton against a parade of soldiers returning home from Afghanistan. Tommy was then 26 and running a plumbing business. The demonstration prompted him to set up the English Defence League. This is the fourth time! The English Defence League is the bravest people in this country. People that are not afraid of political correctness, not afraid of coming under attack, not afraid of being smeared and having their reputation dragged through the mud, and willing to stand up and give a voice to people who don't have a voice in this country. But the EDL quickly developed a reputation for violence, racism and Islamophobia. The movement grew and Tommy became an unlikely spokesman and hero for people who shared his concerns about Islam in Britain. Tommy may have been a hero for the EDL, but to the wider world, he was a pariah. There were counter-demonstrations from groups like Unite Against Fascism at every EDL rally. Mainstream politicians refused to engage with him. And in November 2011, Mo Ansar, a diversity manager and Muslim commentator, set up an online petition calling for the EDL to be banned. I think the English Defence League are a real menace to society. I think they're a threat. I think the government has been complacent in addressing the issues. 
the government's been really clear. They've said if we have groups that um, ferment hatred or are contrary to the public good or to public safety, they will take steps to ban them. So in October 2012, when Tommy was held on remand in prison, his critics were delighted. They believed it would weaken the EDL. Alone for three months in a cell, Tommy began to face up to the real motives of some EDL supporters. I've battled for four years to keep certain elements out of this movement, to keep it down the path that we want to take it down. And I've seen that they've been welcomed back. They're, they're the Nazis and the fascists were welcomed back. Despite this, Tommy continued to lead the EDL, and on May the 25th, Tommy and Mo began their journey together at a rally in Newcastle. Thousands of EDL supporters from all over Britain were out in force. For Mo Anser, attending an EDL rally was a very big first step to take. He was putting himself in real danger. In a democracy, when you're angry and you're frustrated, you protest, and you? You should just vent your frustration in a democracy by using your freedom of assembly, which is what we'll be doing today. If an Englishman commits a crime, if an Englishman on the march today throws a bottle at the police or commits a crime or gives a Nazi salute well, or, well, become, or, 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 is, or is, well, you, you can't... That won't you happen. Can't, I can. I can look, you, you said yourself there are a lot of uh, strange types in the EDL, OK? Not as and many strange he, types as in And Islam. if somebody commits a crime today, is it right for us to blame all English people? Is it right? It's just a yes or no question. No, if, is, is it if right? the people, if the people pick up a book and it says throw a bottle at the police officer, when they throw the bottle at the police officer, of course it is that book's fault. Do you accept that you are adding to a fear and a hysteria no, no. which is causing attacks on Muslims? No, I don't know. On police advice, Mo had to watch from a safe vantage point. Frightening scenes outside, horrifying. I mean, it's thousands and thousands of nationalists, angry. Um, many of them will be drunk, violent waving flags, hostile. Um, it's so hostile, it's not safe for me to be out there. I don't care whether you sound racist. I don't care what you say to me. I don't care if you want to kill me. We don't care whatever you say. We're going to continue to fight it no matter what. We will defeat Islamism or we'll die trying. Despite the doubts Tommy is now feeling privately about his more extreme followers, his public face remains hard line and he is talking to them about, about no more mosques, about stopping immigration, about hardening in every way um, their response towards Muslims in this country. But a more tolerant message against violence and racism is there too. This is not about colour, this is not about race, this is about an ideology. Now, to defeat this ideology, you won't beat it with punches, kicks, bombs or bullets, you need to win the hearts and minds of the people. And we're winning the hearts and minds of the people. Despite Tommy's appeal for a more inclusive membership, Mo is still shocked by scenes of violence at the rally. Mo asked Tommy for a chance to talk to EDL members directly. No Muslim had ever asked to address them before. Tommy set up a meeting in Luton, where it all began. Mo offered to answer questions about Islam as a religion, and he hopes this will allay their fears about the growing number of British Muslims. The people who gathered to hear him needed a lot of convincing, including Kevin Carroll, Tommy's cousin and right-hand man. Islam is a religion of peace, you know, which is the, the biggest joke of all, really. You can't implement a, a, a 7th century dogma into 21st century Western Britain. Can't do it. This country has formed a democracy, and I don't want to revert a thousand years back to medieval times, so I'd like to see how he addresses that question. Not all Muslims are terrorists. We know that's true. But all the terrorists at the moment are Muslim. So what does that say to you? It's an opportunity for him to see that we're not all lunatics. It's an opportunity to talk to him, to ask him questions. I've been spending quite a bit of time with him. I, feel, I like him, but I don't like the ideology he's following, so I try and separate the two of them. Hi, oh, mate. Hey, Tommy. How am I, are you? Good, good, good. I respect the fact that you are the first Muslim that's come in to talk with the English Defence League, mm -hmm. which is getting somewhere to listen to people's concerns. And I want you to realise when you meet them that these people don't hate you, that they are a lot of ordinary people who have concerns and fears about what's happening to their country. I'm very happy and to come here tonight. I think the most important thing is to open up a dialogue. This is Mohammed Ansar, everybody. Say hello. 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 I used to be of the strong view that I thought the English Defence League should be banned. 
Over the last couple of years, I've seen that the EDL have grown in strength, have grown in numbers, and are getting a lot of pop popular support now. And so it's up to public figures, people like me, I think also the government, to engage in what you have to say. As somebody who was born in this country and is British, I think I uphold British values. I'm also a Muslim. Islam is not here to take over the country. Islam is not here to take over the world. That is not the Islam that I know. The Islam that I know is one that lives in coexistence, that one that <coughs> honours and respects British virtues and values. Does but anyone recognise the Islam that Mo's talking about? No. 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 Okay. This, here's the problem. Living in someone like Lubin, yeah. you are not the face of Islam. First, concerns about daughters who have married into Muslim families. We know girls this that have converted to Islam. Sort of yeah. Girls convert life. to Islam and not, they're not allowed to see their mums and dads. If there are girls that convert to Islam that are told you cannot meet your family... You can't right? be trusted. <laughs> Dad can't be trusted. Well, I know loads of girls. If, if that happens, then I will say now clearly that is not allowed in Islam. If the Islamic community want to integrate, why do you punish your children if they go with somebody from a different religion? If we think all Muslims are one monolithic block, if we think that when one Muslim does something wrong, that reflects on all the community. Muslims are not one tribe. They are not no, got one Salafi, group of people Bahibi. who think the same. They think differently, they act differently. So you can't defend Islam, then? Well, it's Islam and Muslims you are two different... defend your Islam, Islam but nobody else's. But Islam and Muslims are two separate things. I can't look at the actions of a Christian priest and condemn all of Christianity for it. And for some, the treatment of gay men in many Islamic countries was a real concern. Why is Islam really homophobic? I've been working for gay rights for the last 15 years, and a lot of people are surprised by that. One thing Islam regards is equality. And a verse of the Quran says, Ta'ala ala qalmitin sawa in bainana bainakum. It's not some kind of a magic spell. What it says is, come to common terms between us and you. But I've got on my shirt. No, no, we're talking about five gay Iranians getting off for being gay. There's been five I've got absolutely. Right. And I've got. And I. Right, under Islam. Right. And I applaud that. If you're saying homophobia is wrong, Islamic scripture must be wrong, because it promotes homophobia. Islam is not homophobic. Would you guys mind if I took a brief break? The meeting adjourned to allow Mo to pray. Mo was pleased. The meeting felt like a good first step. Not all the audience agreed with him, but he was relieved they had listened to each other. They were calm, they were listening, they were very passionate, they had some very strongly held views, and I think it's the kind of thing which we need to do more and more, because that conversation could have gone on for weeks. I think that went good. Um, I hope it's changed Mo's perception. I hope it showed Mo that people have got concerns. I always felt... I didn't want Mo to come here and feel like he was in any way picked on, because the problem is, Mo's the first person that's come to talk to English Wesley. But others weren't so positive. He speaks for his attitude towards Islam, not what Islam is. And as you've heard from the other guys, they live with the actual Islam. He's just pandering to the audience, saying the things that he knows the audience are going to... And he thinks we're all dimwits, we don't read. It was Ramadan, so Mo was not able to eat between sunrise and sunset. Tommy offers to keep him company. How long since you last ate? You don't look like a man who ain't eaten 16 hours, man. 2.30 two, 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 two in the morning. 2.30 in the morning. And now it's um, nearly 9.20. So I'm going to have a date, and then we'll unpack the goodies and we'll see what food we've got. I think it's a nice sign for us to be able to come together to share me breaking the fast, if that's OK with you. I would love to break the fast with you, because I'm actually starving, but that's if we fine. could go to... If we had somewhere <laughs> down the road that done halal, non-halal, yeah. then it'd be more suitable okay. for me. All right. Well, I apologise this time, but maybe next time. Maybe next okay. time, yes. Yeah, so. Despite not breaking bread with Mo, Tommy sums up their meeting in a light that would surprise his critics and even some of the supporters of the EDL. No one from the English Defence League would care about a Muslim living their life peacefully, praying, doing his Ramadan, doing this, doing that, if we didn't see all the hate and we didn't see our culture under attack, we didn't see our existence at threat in this country. But we do. And that's what Mo has to understand. Tommy has personal reasons for the way he feels. His own family lost contact with his cousin 20 years ago. This girl had become a victim of an Asian on-street gang. But she woke up one day in a flat in Berry Park at least 10 men on her, yeah? And then she was found naked running through the streets by, the, prost by the, the cool girls, the prostitutes on the streets, and they took her to the police, who took her home, yeah? and Then the family locked her in the room, because she was on cold, going cold turkey, and then she climbed out the window to get back to them, because she needs the drugs. Uh, and that's the process, and then now she wears a burqa and no-one sees her. 
The recent spate of largely Asian gangs convicted of what has been dubbed on-street grooming in Rochdale, Oxford and Derby has only reinforced Tommy's belief that the problem stems from their religion and they're not isolated cases. The yeah, grooming is most definitely an Islamic problem. Um, if you look in this country, it's predominantly Pakistani Muslim men doing it. There is a, a terrible view of an Islam of women, especially non-Muslim women. Mo vehemently disagrees. To him, the fact that many on-street groomers were also Muslim has nothing to do with their crimes. Tommy arranged for Mo to meet parents in Blackburn whose daughters had been victims of on-street grooming, and also to meet professionals working in this field. For legal reasons, some identities have been disguised. The problem with the Muslim is, um, with, with the Muslim grooming, is it's all gang grooming. Mm. It's um, where it seems to be OK to discuss this within your family and friends, and we'll all go out to groom together. Why do you think we categorise paedophiles as white, but we don't look at their religion, but then Asian ones as Muslim, and we do look at their because religion. Because that's how, how most of the Asian community categorise themselves. We are the Muslim community. You yes, hear them say it all well, the time. Like, and I'm only focusing yeah, on, the, on the Muslim grooming gangs because you're here today to discuss that. <coughs> you're not here to discuss the whole problem with paedophilia and grooming. I'm from Wags, but okay. against grooming. I've seen a lot of what Islam does to a Muslim sorry, man's sorry, how mind. Is it, how does it Islam Because the men sorry. in that family are using Islam as an excuse to treat their females in their family like right. that. And that's wrong, and that's the excuse they always go back to. Okay. Within our religion, this is what we can do. I'm really, really mm. sick of being told that it doesn't happen within a Muslim community, because it does. I accept that we have white men disgustingly going around grooming little girls that aren't old enough properly to think, never mind have sex. Mm. But until people in the Muslim community are prepared to say, hang on a minute, this is happening, this does need stopping. The problem is across the country, across yeah. all communities. Yes. And, yes. If, and, and if we are going to focus on the problems within three and a half million Muslim community in this country, then we also need to focus on the other 60 million people who are not within the Muslim communities. And because we, are, we want to be one community, one nation, who are tackling these issues together, because they're common issues, aren't they? They're common problems. Mo then travelled to meet Tommy across the Pennines in Bradford to talk with others involved in tackling on-street grooming. I think Tommy has a very clear view that this kind of abuse of children or sex crimes are related to the Muslim community, and he believes it goes all the way back to the time of uh, Prophet Muhammad. Two people who risked their reputations to speak out about Asian on-street grooming were persuaded to talk to Tommy and Mo. Mohammed Shafiq heads a Muslim youth organisation and Anne Cryer was Labour MP for Keithley. Anne tried to help many families whose daughters were victims of Asian on-street grooming. Their daughters were 12 and 13-year-olds and all of those offenders uh, who were corrupting these girls uh, were from, I'm afraid, the Pakistani community. Uh, and the reason that I believe, I may be wrong, but I believe the reason that neither the police nor social services would touch these cases, I, I was begging them. I was round at the police station virtually every week when I came up to Keithley. And I think it was they were afraid of being called racist. There is a significant over-representation of Pakistani men uh, in, in, in the on-street gang grooming of which the majority um, of the girls that are groomed are white. So, you know, we, we as a community, if you like, have to be honest and open about that. We've all got a duty to what we say, tackle okay to say child abuse. But the difference is you're you don't... You're a heroic, you... heroic moderate for saying it. I'm, I'm a far-right hooligan. Anne Cryer tried but failed to get her local mosque to talk to suspects' families. I went to a friend of mine who was a local councillor uh, and he happened to be a Muslim and therefore he was able to represent me to the elders yeah. because I felt it was a good move to try to get those elders yeah. involved. Yeah, it was a good move. And I hoped that I would be able to persuade the elders to go knocking on doors and say to them, this behaviour is un-Islamic and I want it to stop uh, because I'm going to tell the whole community about you and what you're doing if you don't. Now, they weren't prepared to do that. Acknowledging the problem with the community's response to the crimes is one thing. Introducing a possible reason linked to their faith 
is quite another. There is a possibility for me that this is to link to Islam. Maybe it's not, but maybe it is. When you have in the Quran... How can you say it's linked to Islam? Because it, in the, on what basis? In the, in the, What's your okay, evidence? OK, the Quran, you can take sexual slaves. Oh, I mean, you can take I'm sexual just, slaves. Whatever you really Outside of your four wives... That you can take yeah. non-Muslim okay, women as sexual slaves. Okay. I don't think you could find it. It is nice to see you reading the Quran, though, I have to say. It's yeah. obviously not making a difference, is it? Because you still distorted it. If you fear, it. If, no, I'm not distorting. I'm you reading. Distorted. I'm reading. If you fear that you not deal justly with the orphan girls, then marry those that please you of other women. Two, three, or four. If you fear that that will not be just, then take what your right arm possesses, i.e., slaves. Where does it say sexual slaves? Slaves, you can take. No, se where does it say sexual slaves? Can... Where does it say sexual slaves? You don't take... distort it. Well, Mr. maybe Robinson. it's not me misrepresenting it. Maybe it's the groomers that are misrepresenting this. Would we all agree that these girls that have been targeted of these gangs? are slaves, being treated like slaves. Ugh. Can we agree? Look, I think that is a very unhelpful way unhelpful. of tackling the issue. Yeah. They're being right. treated like slaves, and we have chapters in here that tell them it's OK to take non-Muslim women as slaves, and to me, that needs to be if explored. You, Tommy, if, if that's not right, it says slaves. Tommy, uh, only, only a few weeks ago, we saw imams uh, over 500 mosques uh, deliver a sermon against grooming. That's good. OK? In 2002, when it started, when you, when you dealt that first, very first case here in Keithley, they got four years. Now they're getting life sentences. Do you think it has anything to do with the ideology behind the fact that under Sharia, as soon as a girl starts puberty, she's fair game, yeah? No, now, absolutely not. Yes, it is. A Muslim man, for example, cannot have sex outside of marriage, cannot marry somebody who is not a consenting adult, and can certainly not commit any of these offences. Islam is utterly, utterly against grooming, child abuse, any form of abuse against any individual. Like Tommy, Anne thinks the Muslim community could have done much more to tackle the groomers. To Mo, Tommy continually tries to unfairly blame the religion of Islam for criminal acts. Tommy's tried to create a link between some theological aspects and linking them with paedophilia. And that's wrong. Whatever sources he's using, they're deeply flawed. To Tommy, the sacred texts seem to provide an excuse. Everyone wants, wants to shout down my points, but they can't tackle the point. It says in the Quran that you can take non-Muslim women as slaves. What do they do with slaves? If it's in there, we must explore that avenue. A meeting was set up in London at the end of August with two experts on the Quran. This is the first time Tommy would meet somebody from Quilliam, a counter-extremism think tank. Dr. Osama Hassan from Quilliam is a scientist and Islamic scholar, whilst historian Tom Holland has written groundbreaking books on the birth of Islam. Tommy used this opportunity to go straight to his belief that it is Islamic texts that are to blame for gang abuse of young girls. Basically, outside of your four wives, you can take whatever your right arm possesses, yeah? Now, how do we understand that? That referred to slavery, which are... Concubines. Yeah, yeah. concubines, which included sexual slavery. Now, that was part of ancient culture. Tom is delighted they seem to agree with his position. And all the do's and don'ts in the Quran are all conditioned by um, principles of justice, mercy, the common good, public welfare, etc. And they're all actually liable to change. Islam does face a problem in that the, the Holy Scriptures derive from a very Old remote time. period. The Quran, the Hadiths, um, classical jurisprudence take for granted the existence of slavery. Yeah, and so the, the, absolutely, but there is then the problem in, the green, in, in, the green in, in a society the that takes for granted that slavery is a wrong. How do you then square that with the fact that in the Bible, in the Quran, slavery seems to be taken for granted? Why, do, why does God not issue a firm prohibition? The situation is very similar to, to women, actually. If you read the Quran now, some of the verses relating to women seem to discriminate against women. Um, but for that time, they actually were revolutionary and they really improved women's rights. Which, which is continued. precisely why which I think it's to vital to historicise the Quran yes. and to work out where these commentaries come from, to situate them in a particular place and time. Again, Tommy feels the learned men are expressing what he thinks too, but Mo doesn't. What's going on here is that the, the core principles within the Qur'an, the, the principles of brotherhood and of justice, they predominate, they are eternal. Maybe the specific things, the, the details about slavery, the um, commands within some of the hadiths to kill apostates, to kill homosexuals, they are the ones that can be phased out because humanity has moved on. Now, oh, that seems to me the so way ahead for a British form of Islam to emerge. I believe that we need to reform the, reform the book and certain verses of hate and certain verses that glorify murder and rape 
need to be taken out or addressed or warnings put in or something to say that this is no longer taught in as part of British Islam. If one of my children came home with a school book, a reading book from school, and they were unable to read or understand parts of the book, I don't rip out the pages and put them to one side. I'd say, let's educate better. People are dying, mate. People are dying. It's not like a new daughter's coming home from a school book. I, I, I agree with you that uh, Muslims in this country certainly have to step up the efforts against the extremists and the reformers. That's something I've tried to do and colleagues of mine have tried to do. We face death threats and intimidation for what we're saying also. And uh, that does need to be addressed, you know, how we address it. Yeah, but we're looking, by the way, at a very small number of verses which are what you might call uh, problematic in, in our times. The vast majority of the Quran is about the wonders of God, about the wonders of creation. I believe that there needs to be immense pressure put on the Islamic community in this country to realise that what, how we feel in our country. You need to make the distinction between Muslims that need reformation and Islam as a theology and Islam as a way of life and a value system, which I don't think does need reform. That's where I, I think I disagree, because I think that Islam, like any institutionalised religion in this country, is subject to incredible pressures. And those pressures are partly to do with historical research. It, it changed the way Christians understand their faith. I'm sure it will change the way Muslims understand their faith. The impact of science and increased understanding of the universe. And above all, people of all religions in Britain are now living in an incredibly liberal society. And there's been an absolute revolution in the understanding of, say, the status of women, um, the status of homosexuality. I have no doubt that the form of Islam that emerges from this, it's kind of weathering, waves beating against it, will be a much less literalist, a much less fundamentalist Islam. I speak often about an enlightened, progressive, modern, British con context for Islam. Then I think we are on that journey. We're certainly not there. We're on that journey. Tommy's in a hurry for us to get there quickly, but up, I think we have. I think we sort have. It out. These things take time. <laughs> these things take time. Tommy now held Osama Hassan in great esteem. Seems like a good guy. I was doing a lot of reading on him as well. Really outspoken against extremism. I want them to bring their ideology forward. And I keep saying it's not down to us to define a British Islam. It's down to them. It's down to the Muslims in this country. Yet, just a week later, Tommy is back on the streets leading an EDL march into one of London's most Muslim areas, Tower Hamlets. There is no such thing in this country as a Muslim area. <laughs> the rhetoric was anti-Muslim and there was no sign he had any doubts about the power of on-street protest, as he later claimed. Do I want to come out of here and keep shouting on street corners and, and, and us and them and kicking off? It's not what I want. I mean, I want what's right for my kids and I want what's right for everyone's kids. And that is to bring dialogue and, and obviously, we're not, we're not saying we're going to agree on everything, but this is about working out. This is a slow process, but it's about sitting down and working out where we go from here. Islam is one of the few religions whose followers may be clearly recognised by what they wear. And in recent years, more British Muslims have felt free to present themselves in ways abandoned by their parents when they came to Britain a generation or two ago. As Muslims have come here and become more educated, the younger generation starts asking questions. Who am I? What am I about? Where do I come from? What do I believe? And so maybe 20 or 30 years ago, we would have seen fewer beards and fewer headscarves. But increasingly, as Muslims feel closer and stronger in their identity, I think people like Tommy have seen that and have become scared. And it's nothing to be scared of. The world's a big place. Muslims see wearing these clothes as self-expression. But some critics, including Tommy, see it as Islamic repression, especially of women. Only last month, a student petition with 8,000 signatures forced Birmingham Metropolitan College to lift its ban on face veils. And in London, a row erupted when a judge ruled a female defendant had to remove her veil when giving evidence. So Mo has arranged for Tommy to meet a leading female Muslim politician, the former leader of the Respect Party, Salma Yaqub, to discuss the issue of dress. Is there a religious need to wear a burqa? There's an emphasis on modesty, but people interpret that in many different ways. You can, see, you can see for yourself, some Muslim women cover their hair, some don't, some cover the face. Mm. Most don't, it's just a tiny minority do. I personally don't, as you can see, but I would not want to impose my views on anybody else. I think the vast majority of the people in this country would want the burqa banned, due to the fact that there could be anybody under that burqa walking down the street. Is, what's the point in having CCTV? The burqa is a security so, risk. Again, I, I think you're very good at this in terms of trying to smear and merge two very different issues. I believe that women should be allowed to cover what they want. I believe that women should be allowed to not cover what they want. It shouldn't be up to men or a state 
Why do Muslim women cover their hair? It's like the same on. as in the Judeo-Christian tradition where there's been an encouragement of modesty and, and so it's seen as that. Statues of Mary, you'll see that she's covered and, you know, she's covered from head to toe. Mm. I wear a wedding ring, it, it's a signal. And that's what the hijab is about. It's, it's, it's saying that I don't interact beyond a certain boundary when I, when I mix with, uh, with other guys. When, when you say it's for modesty and it's not, not to feel, to, so it's to let men know and things like that, I get all that, yeah? But when we have seven-year-old children wearing hijabs, that's when I'm like, well, what's the reason why she's covering her, her hair then? Don't parents have the right to bring their children up in their religious tradition? Mm -hmm. Many Muslim women that I speak to say, and my wife will say the same, and my daughters who sometimes wear it, sometimes don't, they cover their hair not only as a sign of modesty, but also they want to identify themselves. It's part of their mm. identity. I mean, I, as a Muslim woman, feel uncomfortable when I mm -hmm. see young girls, mm -hmm. you know, as, you know if, they, if they're seven, so many six, because I do think it's about being grown up, yeah. right? And so that, for me, is about parenting, and you can see there'll be different views amongst parents how they do things. To Mo, dress is about displaying your faith. To Salma, it's a choice about modesty for grown women. For Tommy, accepting Salma's view is a big step. At this moment, to the outside world, Tommy is defined as the leader of the street-fighting Islamophobic EDL. But privately, he's visiting the Aisha Mosque in Walsall with Mo. A few months earlier, it was attacked with a homemade bomb, and initially, the EDL was blamed. It was quickly proved that there was no link to the EDL. This is the first time Tommy has ever entered a mosque. To some of his followers, this would be unthinkable, and Tommy, too, still has misgivings about the role of mosques in Britain. I think a mosque is a command and control centre. I think the last thing they do in there is pray. I don't want any more mosque built, because I, be, I believe we're adding to the problem. When Islam integrates and assimilates in the same way every other ideology and, and religion has, then they can build more mosques. We'll take our shoes off here, and we'll put them on here, and then we'll go through. No problem. No Mo took Tommy upstairs to watch the afternoon prayers. Most of the men below were completely unaware the leader of the English Defence League was in their midst. Tommy thinks it's wrong that women have to pray in a separate area behind the men. You couldn't concentrate, and I couldn't concentrate if we had to pray behind a woman. Could you concentrate? Genuinely, could you concentrate? Yeah, I'll get that. I'll take it. Right. So normally, in one prayer space. Now the question is, how can women concentrate when there's two behind men? Clearly, we're not that attractive. But the women are stood at the back, and the men are stood at the front, and that's why it works. Once prayers were over, Mo took Tommy into the musala or prayer room. With no overseeing body running British Islam, Tommy questioned how mosques are able to combat extremist beliefs. Say there's a local loony Islamist who's potential terrorists. Okay. Say, for example, you know the, the lads that tried to blow the English Defence League up? Uh -huh. One of them worked in a mosque. Uh -huh. He was the youth leader in the mosque. Uh -huh. So how come he wasn't spoiled? If you've got a congregation here, and the overwhelming majority will, will regulate what goes on in mosques, the committee, the congregation will hear what's said. And they are very much self-policing. Uh -huh. Not one mosque has reported one extremist. One of Britain's leading Muslim scholars, Sheikh Ibrahim Mogra, was keen to meet Tommy. He was joined by Imam Shay, who leads this congregation. Hi, lads. How are you doing, all right? Nice to meet you. Hi, Tommy. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Welcome. And this is our Imam here. He has a, Make a, present. a gift a present. for you. A present. Read and go through. I've got one of these, you know, That's good. part of this Islamic you, you... outreach centre. My daughter's yeah. five years old. She yeah. came home and said, Mum, do you go to the mosque? Yeah. My daughter. Yeah. Do you go to the mosque? Yeah. It's a special place where people pray. Yeah. Mm. Really good. So it's, it's nice. I'm uncomfortable. Yeah. I'm uncomfortable. It's so important for them to learn about Christians, about Jews, Hindus, and everybody else. Otherwise, they'll grow up not appreciating the good that all these different religions have. Tommy wanted Sheikh Mogra to explain how British rights and values are upheld when they clash with fundamentalist ideas. Every mosque I look at, I can go on and I can find a homophobic, anti-Semitic preacher who will come into this country and give a sermon. And they should be stopped. Do you stand for gay people's rights? Of course. Do you stand yes, for gay marriage? Yes. Uh, if the two individuals who are of the same sex want to be married and they go for a civil partnership or marriage, whatever it is, 
if it is provided within the constitution and within the legal systems of our country, then they are entitled to. To be a good Muslim, I first have to be a good human being before anything. I disagree with a lot of your views, but I respect you as a human being. But I cannot harm you. I'm not allowed. It's forbidden. For well, I wish me. everyone felt like that, because all they I get are, is death threats. Are. People want no. to smash my face no, in. No, I get Tommy, well, I'll tell you. Murder look, my kids, look, murder look, my wife. Don't, please, please don't, don't measure Islam by the behavior of some. Measure Islam by godly, peaceful people. There are, there are two million of us in this country, right? You haven't There's received... Six million of you in yeah. this country, but, Okay, six million. Yeah. But you, haven't, you haven't received six million death threats. You might have received... No, to be honest, million. for yeah. every death threat yeah. I get, I meet, a great, I, I meet a great Muslim. When I'm walking around in the town centre, I have Muslims come up to me and, and they're very peaceful. There you go. Tommy is so surprised by Sheikh Margaret's views, he raises doubts that he's typical. I, I've read articles on yourself today... You have, yeah. ..that, that say you're a non-Muslim. <laughs> Mus Muslims that say, because of your belief, you, you are an infidel. Yeah, but God is, God is the judge. I'm not worried about what people say about me. I have to stand before God and answer for my actions. I try my best to be a good human being, to be a good Muslim, disagreeing with you, but respecting you, because you are God's creation. Ibrahim Mogra believes extending the hand of friendship to Tommy comes directly from Islamic belief. The Quran tells me to dialogue with people, especially people that I disagree with. And it promises that you might be surprised pleasantly that you turn out to become good friends. And so we have to talk. We must dialogue. We disagree with the views of the EDL. Um, I totally oppose their racism and their anti-Muslim and anti-Islam stance. But that doesn't mean I should shun them. I, it, it means that I should reach out to them and help them understand what the real Islam is and what real Muslims are like. And hopefully they'll be forced to rethink their strategy. Mo and Tommy rounded off their visit in the family area. The women had prepared a feast to welcome their guests. But, smells good. <laughs> Chicken korma. <laughs> I'm going to sit down and have some food. Oh, I'm all right, man. Eating their halal food on camera was still a step too far for Tommy, but he's certainly warming to them. I feel awkward not eating. Why would I have a problem with those sort of people? Do you know what I mean? It's one of them. But at the same time, we have to keep... This country is a Christian country, and to me, it is being overtaken. And when does diversity and tolerance become takeover. That's what I see. Early October, and the next stage in Tommy and Mo's journey is with Quilliam, a counter-extremism think tank named after one of Britain's first converts to Islam, William Quilliam. Majid Nawaz set it up in 2007. Originally, Quilliam was funded under Labour's Prevent Strategy, a policy deeply resented by many Muslims. Majid had been an Islamist for 13 years, and recruited for Hizbut Tahrir, campaigners for an Islamic caliphate. Imprisoned for political activity in Egypt for five years. After his release, he rejected Islamism and became a very vocal counter-extremist. The EDL and far-right extremist groups believe that there is no such thing as a moderate Muslim. They believe that all, uh, all Muslims who pretend to be moderate say one thing in public and another in private. Having researched Quilliam, Tommy was looking forward to meeting Majid. But because he'd been selected to stand for Parliament, on the day Majid refused to sit down with Tommy. But he was keen to challenge Mo. Majid revealed the deep divisions between him and Mo on how to interpret Sharia law. Has there been any evolution in your own thinking as a result of your interactions with Tommy? I don't know particularly. I think I've, I come from a very, uh, I think I come from a very reasonable place. If your views haven't changed, then I assume, if I may, that your perspective on, say, uh, the Qur'an says, as sariqu wa sariqatu faqta'u aydihima. Uh, the male and female thief cut their hands off. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with chopping off someone's hand as a punishment for theft? No, I don't agree with chopping off someone's hand as a, as a punishment mm -hmm. for theft. If an Islamic State existed, should it chop off someone's hand for theft if all the Sharia conditions are met? Please, yes or no? I, I I, yes or no? I, I no. Don't... Yes or no? Please, answer that. Yes or no? Look, I'll tell you my I, answer. No. What's yours? Right. I, on some of my yep. theological views, yep. Yep. I'm clear. Yep. On other theological views, I'd like to hear what the consensus of the scholars would be. Right. And on other theological views, I'm not made up. OK, well, if one were to ask me about my views on stoning someone to death, mm. yeah, whether now or in a hypothetical ideal Islamic state, mm. I don't believe it's morally justifiable 
to defer the answer and say, I'm not sure whether someone should be stoned to death or not. That's morally reprehensible. Hearing how Majid argued so vehemently against Mo about basic human rights was a revelation to Tommy. I didn't think a Muslim would confront Mo Ansar because I thought Mo Ansar was being built as the, the acceptable face of Islam. And that's everything that I think is wrong. So when I, when I saw this and I read more up about Quilliam and I looked at what Quilliam has done, I looked about they've, bought, they've actually bought change, which is what I want, I want to do. I want to bring change. I want to tackle Islamist extremism. I want to tackle neo-Nazi extremism. They're opposite sides of the same coin. Straight after Majid and Mo's heated conversation, Tommy and Mo had to meet a group of Muslims at a London club. Some were Quilliam staff, including Osama Hassan, the Quranic expert. Others were from other Muslim organizations. All shared concerns about Tommy and the EDL. They were keen to know whether his journey with Mo had changed him. What they heard was a Tommy clearly realizing that there were Muslims he could reach out to. I don't hate Muslims, okay? When I look nationally, well, there's, say, four or five million Muslims in this country. They're not gonna pack up and leave tomorrow. What we have to reach out for is reformists and true moderate Muslims. Nobody's denying your right to protest. Nobody's denying your right to criticize. I think it's just the tactics in the way it comes across. And there are some unsavory characters within your uh, organization that turn up to protest and they have those banners and they have those things and the slogans. I've known that deep down for two years thinking we need to change somehow, we do need to change. The assembled Muslims could see this was a big admission for Tommy to make. For most of them, this was the first time they learned that he harboured any doubts at all. We do have, we, British Muslim communities, have a lot of work to do. There's no doubt about that. We have a lot of issues that are still being brushed under the carpet, some of which you've already spoken about. I'm part of your culture, I'm part of your tradition, and I absolutely love the country that I live in. So I, I absolutely agree with you. I think the Muslim community has not been at the forefront of change. Of change. We have not honoured the, you know, the precepts of Islam, which actually have so much to do with British culture. The problem in this country is extremist Islam, and the English Defence League are a symptom of that problem. Well, the answer is for ref to reform. To, re to reform Islam, or, Islam yeah. or Muslims? Both. And how do you reform Islam? By taking out the hate. The Quran should be reformed in the same way the Bible was. You're just going to wind up all the Muslims who would have given you support because I've been sitting here for the past hour and a half thinking I agree with so much that you say. But then you end with that, reform the Quran, and now you've got me furious. <laughs> I can give you any... Tommy has gone too far for some but not for Dr. Hassan from Quilliam. I agree that it's Muslims who have to engage in reform. I've found through experience it's very difficult. After serving as the Imam for over 25 years, when I tried to raise difficult questions uh, at my own mosque, I was booted out and received death threats for it. The meeting ends on a high. There was consensus for change, even if not on the methods. Mo is keen to reflect on the changes he's experienced since he began his journey with Tommy. I think Tommy's opened my eyes to a number of things. I think the first of those things is that there is a lot of genuine fear, hostility, frustration and anger amongst the white, non-Muslim majority within this country. And they've got real questions which we have to address. And the day with Quilliam had even more of an impact on Tommy. To be honest, some of the lads I've, I've read a lot about Quilliam, um, massively impressed. And although your man, Majid, didn't want to sit and talk to me. It's like they're the Muslims that I see as, being, as shaping the future for Islam in Britain. Look, people, we just have to look at it realistically. The Muslims are not going to leave Britain, they're here. So we have to make the best of the situation. And the best of the situation is finding the really good ones and the really moderate ones and, and pushing them to the forefront and making sure that they're the ones that are heard. Away from the cameras, Tommy reached out to Majid. In a series of telephone calls and secret meetings, they began to believe they could work together. So then they discussed the unthinkable, Tommy to quit the EDL and work with Quilliam. Majid knew from his own experience of leaving his but Teria that this was a very difficult decision for Tommy. This isn't about publicity. Both of us have sacrificed to be in this position, but both of us passionately believe in what? In an inclusive, united Britain, where Muslims and non-Muslims can all live together in peace and harmony. One week later, the world's media assembled in Bloomsbury to question him about why he was leaving the EDL to join forces with a leading Muslim think tank. Mo, having seen the announcement on Twitter, cancelled everything and hurried up from Hampshire to be there too. 
naturally there are going to be a lot of people who are very skeptical about Quilliam and Tommy working together. Only recently we've seen Tommy's behaviour has been perhaps less than noble and there are going to be questions raised about is this merely a tactical move? Is this a cynical ploy to put himself forward in, in the eyes of the public or is this a genuine attempt? But Mo was kept waiting. I know, sir, but we're not allowing nobody in at the moment to six o'clock, sorry. And once he'd gained access with the crew, all were thrown out. Tommy texted to explain. He didn't want Mo claiming any credit for this momentous decision. I'm really disappointed with how things have turned out. I've spent 80 months talking to Tommy and going on a journey to learn about Islam, to extend a hand, uh, and I thought it was important to develop a dialogue. Part of asking for the English Defence League to uh, put down their hate and their prejudice was about having a dialogue, and today it's fallen flat on its face. And Mo wasn't the only one to feel rejected by Tommy. In South London, a group of EDL organisers and supporters gathered over a drink. One was unwilling to show his face. People were just so stunned, totally betrayed, <laughs> totally. And I felt like someone had ripped me out of here today. And that's being serious. We've been quite close to Tommy over the last nine months. And uh, I just couldn't believe it. I'm quite surprised that they chose Quilliam, bearing in mind Quilliam's history and the people behind Quilliam which are uh, Islamic extremists themselves. Tommy's choices of, of walking away and getting back into mainstream life are, are very, very limited. You know, I mean, he's, he's always going to be known as Tommy Robinson, the guy that ran the EDL. The EDL will carry on carry the way on. it is. It's only two down, isn't it? Tommy and Kevin Carroll were only the face of the EDL. The people out in the streets of the not EDL, not Tommy and Kevin Carroll. Seven years ago, Majid Nawaz turned away from Islamic extremism, founded Quillian, and built it into a respected organisation. Tommy has now chosen to follow a similar path, to reject the often violent actions of some EDL supporters and to work with Quillian on a new way to tackle what he sees as an Islamist problem in Britain. Both Tommy and Majid know it's a risk for them personally and for what they believe in. Ladies and gentlemen, only time will tell how successful this is, but I genuinely hope uh, that this will work out. For me last night, it was either the end and everything's going to come crashing around, down around me, or it's the beginning of a new era. And I'm positive, and I believe this is definitely a step forward. And I believe it's beneficial for all communities, and I believe that there's nothing more powerful than working together.